We are just waiting for a few more of our players. While we're waiting for them, I will go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to Pirates of Drynax. Uh, this is the finale episode of the Honor Among Thieves, episode one of the main Pirates of Drynax campaign. Uh, but trust me, there will be many more uh, because there are a whole bunch of minor plots and nine other main episodes to this campaign. So there's we got a lot of material to get through. But this is the finale of episode one. Before we get started, I would like to thank the friends of the Greenwater Guild Hall. <clears throat> the first on that list is uh, the Speechless Bart. She and her husband make beautiful leather products. Uh, such as covers for your core rule books. She has uh, a complete line of dice bracelets, a very popular uh, one of the dice bracelets that she did for this month was the pride bracelet where every dice on the bracelet is a different color. <clears throat> she has a, um, a mat that you roll out to roll your dice on and when you scroll, roll it up it looks like a spell scroll. So yeah, uh, definitely check her out. If you're watching on Twitch, uh, you should see some tiles uh, down below the video, but if you don't see the tiles, click on my profile image, those tiles should pop up for you. Um, if you're going to order from the Speechless Bard, keep in mind that she's in the UK, and so if it is a time-sensitive uh, product, then please uh, give it a little bit of time. Um, give yourself a little bit of extra time if it's time-sensitive or a gift or something like that, because it takes a while to cross the pond and to make it through U.S. Customs. Next on the list is Fable Beard Company. Fable Beard Company makes beard products such as bombs, oils, uh, butters, and co-wash. Uh, each scent profile is a different fantasy character. Uh, right now I am wearing the Candyman, which smells like uh, candied caramel apples. I'm sure you'll find a scent profile that is suitable for you and your tastes. Um, if you are a first-time purchaser, they have a buy one, get one free offer uh, where <coughs> uh, after you create an account, um, you can take two beard oils and put them in your cart. And if you use the code FIRST, the second beard oil will be discounted to free. And last, uh, I would like to uh, say that... Um, oh, hold on. There we go. Hello, Alyssa. Uh, last, I would like to say that Talon and Claude did, after seven months, finally make good, and they sent me my custom DM screen and uh, the felt pads that I had ordered for my council, two Council of Seven Dice Vaults, and uh, to sweeten the deal for having waited so long, they threw in a... Um, dice tray uh, for the that will hold one of the Council of Seven dice vaults and uh, so it took them seven months but they finally got the order right and uh, made good on it so thank you Talon and Claw for, for making that right uh, hold on let me message Corey see where he's at Oh my gosh, that's yep, that's him. Never mind. <laughs> I'll jump in the gun. Hello, Corey. Hello. So where we left off. Uh, you guys had uh, been contacted by Admiral Darokin, uh, who it is rumored is a one of the secret lords of Thieve, one of the uh, pirate lords that run the planet. And he didn't come out and say it directly, but um, he certainly implied that he would be very happy if you were to kill Farrakh Red Thing. However, he told you that if you were to do so, um, to that you were to not return to Thieve uh, for one year. Now, you didn't really want to kill Farrakh Red Thing anyways, 
Uh, there is a, between the planets Torpal and Clark, the combined bounty is 2.5 mega credits, and so you would kind of like to bring him back. Um, it, the, the bounty was dead or alive, but you're going to gain a lot more if you bring him back alive. Uh, there's more to this than just money. And so, um, you, Daroken told you where to find Miria Silverhand, uh, who is um, Ferric Red Thane's trusted lieutenant and uh and right hand as it is and he had sent her to thieve to try and make a deal with one of the other pirate gangs either the gang of peter valis or the gang of hurl iron tooth and uh before she could seize such a deal um or nail it down you guys came in and caught her um she at first was going to blow herself up. Um, you were able to talk her down and uh, you were able to get her to agree to message Ferric Redthane. Come to find out uh, she and Ferric Redthane are um, they consider themselves married, whether that's you know true or not. Whatever. Uh, they're clearly a couple of some kind. And she begged you to not kill him and you agreed as long as she sent a message uh, out to him. He is hiding on a methane moon uh, uh, out at the very edge of the Thieves solar system. And so rather than make the long journey out there, you did a jump, uh, in-system jump, and after a week you are coming out of the in-system jump. Now the, the <clears throat> radio communication from Thieve to uh, Red Thane, she that she would have sent would have only taken about 22 hours, 22, 25 hours, somewhere in there. There's a, a time delay of about 25 hours, I guess. Um, but still, it would have taken you, you know, two and a half weeks to get from Thieve out to the outer system. And so rather than do that, you just did an in-system jump, which is perfectly acceptable. And after a week, you have now come out of jump, and this these are the two moons that you see. Um, this is out in a <clears throat> stellar, um, astro very sparse asteroid field, um, much like the Oort cloud in our, our own solar system. Uh, there are dwarf planets. The largest thing out here would be a dwarf planet, um, which is essentially, they call them moons, I guess that fits whatever, but um, essentially these are two dwarf planetoids that are orbiting one another in the Oort cloud. And sometimes they knock things out and this is where you get comets and um, stellar debris coming into the inner system. Did somebody go all staticky? Or is that me? I think it's you. Yeah, it might be. I was crocheting near the thing. Oh. Ah, you see. Is that it? Is that? No, it sounded like just white noise. Okay, never mind. Somebody's jamming our signals. So, um, now. Before we get started, did you see the PDF? It was a one-page news blurb that I had posted in our Facebook group. Did you guys take a look at that? Uh, no, I will do that now. So in our okay. Facebook Messenger group, just saying you'll probably want to peruse that. It's very short. It's only one page. Um, it That news page, Traveler News Service page, lays out all of the basic plot hooks of what you'll be doing for like the next four to six weeks. I, uh, I had a burst of creative energy on Monday and uh, set up basically all of your crap for the next month and a half to two months. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to take that long. It really depends on how long 
you spend doing stuff, but if you want to really do it right and get all the bang for the buck out of it, I'm probably looking at about six weeks worth of material there. So. Well, thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> and I, I kind of planned to, to do the the um, Traveler News Service uh, art or uh, news pages um, at certain points when it when it becomes necessary to um, convey in-game lore and what's really going on in-game um, that you may not actually be um, present for. And so this is how you get that information. And one thing to also keep in mind is because uh, communications in Traveler is what we would call the age of sail in that there's no faster than light communication. And so uh, all of this information is is handled by export or uh, traders that trade in mail and information and so <clears throat> some of this information may be either a week out of date at the least or it could be you know months out of date depends on how long it took for it to get to the current news source or to wherever it is that you picked up the information so that's something to keep in mind so uh, you come out of uh, Jump Space, and these are the two planet toids that you find. Who would like to do an electronic sensors check? I think I have the highest. Um, so. Okay, I'm going to out of the thing. All right. Wow, you exactly nailed it. Um, so you are picking up uh, very faint radiation from the uh, the second moon, the one closer to the bottom left corner of the map. Uh, how do you want to approach this? Do you want to just approach where you're picking up this faint uh, uh, information or this this radiation trace, or? Do you want to radio ahead and announce yourselves? I think we should radio ahead. Um, any, any votes against that? Does anyone care? Radio ahead. Alright. All right. So, what are you going to say? Um, like your wife. So we did we did we decide on a safe word last week? <laughs> oh yeah, like drop into conversation. I want to say it was strawberries. <laughs> okay. But we 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 arranged. We wanted to, him to know, like, have a code word, so we knew we weren't nefarious. So we thought we weren't nefarious. Yeah, I see cucumber. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Strawberry sea cucumbers. Um, so you drop, you casually drop that into conversation, and I can hope that um, it'll go along with us again. Mostly. Make a. I'm starting to work. Again. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm starting to worry that those are going to plot against us and that this is a bad idea but um we're, we're already in the middle of it so it's kind of hard to change course uh, <laughs> yeah i i guess we have any proof that she's alive and we didn't murder her because we put it all no wait she messaged him that's right right okay. she messaged him i'm just gonna stop thinking out loud because yeah i'll figure it out in a minute i'm a little tired yeah i hear that <laughs> so does he have to roll um, yeah, so, so how are you going to, how are you going to work, uh, strawberry sea cucumber into your conversation of radioing ahead? I, I, I'm kind of amused to hear how this is going to turn out. I'm not very subtle. I can't really say, like, so-and-so said X, Y, Z, yeah. Wish I had a creative way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I I would say I would hail them and say uh, 
is there a restaurant to get quality strawberry sea cucumber ice cream on either of these planetoids? <laughs> and that's a good way to go. All right. Just like out of curiosity, y'all know of this at all? Yeah, that's the way to go. I knew she was <laughs> now. Uh, Ferragrethane radios back <clears throat> and he says uh, uh, this is Captain Redthane of the Janel Torsk I've received information from my wife uh, uh, concerning uh, your agreement he says uh, given my current present circumstances um that would be probably the best course of action available to me. However, don't be too hasty to try and take me into custody. I have information that you may find interesting. I invite you to meet aboard my vessel and we can discuss this uh, information. You may decide to change your mind. I'm listening. Let's go. Okay. Uh, so. Do do we want to send you on to their ship? Or, or send someone on to their ship? Or should we try and get them on ours? Instead. He invited us on to his ship. Right, I just don't know if we want to go to there. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you can certainly uh, broker with him. I mean, Raph is your broker expert. Oh, yeah, she's got a girlfriend with brokers. I am hardly an expert. Yeah, I am but I can try. Well... You're you're probably better than everybody else at it. <laughs> right. Or I could try. I don't know. I mean, I know splitting the party isn't a great idea, but like, at the very least, making sure that we it, we can be armed when we come aboard, or you know, setting out the ground rules so that we aren't ambushed again. Well, we'll be bringing the battle dress. Excellent. Well, let's try and broker an agreement where he comes onto our ship because he's going to end up there anyway. So, we'll right. Maybe, maybe he can come aboard, but he can bring his second uh, with him until we've settled on a deal. Yeah. Um, let's try and broker that and see if we can make that happen. I just, yeah, the ship could be like a trap. Like maybe he doesn't care about his life anymore and he's just going to blow us all up or who knows. So that's a good point. So, Raph, go ahead and make a broker plus uh, intellect check. And let's see what you get. Seven. Uh, Red Thane insists that... Uh, uh, well, he doesn't insist. He, he tells you... Uh, fairly point blank that the rest of his crew and his marines would feel more comfortable if you came aboard his ship. They, his marine, uh, his marine captain or commander, especially, is concerned that you will just execute Red Thane as soon as you see him. Okay, so he's probably not going to kill all of his um, shipmates. It makes me feel like by you know exploding the ship, so that possibility is gone. There's others though, like armed combat and whatnot. So um, say you, are you coming with me? Because I'll, I'll go aboard and listen. He tells you that. I'll go with you. He says he tells you that it's perfectly acceptable that you're all armed. He that's fine with him. Unless let's do it. <laughs> All right, so Chin Chi, make a piloting check. Uh, 
11. Okay. So, no problem. Ching Shi uh, is able to uh, bring the ship down and land next to uh, this, uh, this little far trader that is on the surface of this moon. Now, of course, um, you know, you have to exit your ship to enter his ship. Um, and the, the, this planetoid, um, it barely qualifies for having an atmosphere. It's very thin. So in order for your, you to do, make the journey from your ship to his ship, you would all have to be wearing a vac suit of some kind, um, or combat armor or battle dress, if you have it. And there are plenty of vac seats on the ship, so. So you suit up and you make your way over to the Janal Torsk and, <clears throat> or the Janal Torsk, and the airlock opens and inside you see two Marines <clears throat> dressed in, um, they're wearing boarding vac suits uh, for armor. And they're both armed with cutlasses and, uh, and advanced combat rifles. And, uh, they, it's not like they welcome you with open arms. The commanding officer, the, the, the lead commander, uh, just has this dour look on his face. And as soon as the airlock cycles, it opens up and he's chewing on a cigar and he, he uh, says, well, let's get this over with and leads you into the common area of the Janelle Torsk. I'd like to offer you some money, though. I'm just kidding, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I probably wouldn't go over <laughs> uh, Hold on here. I have, I thought I had something for this. I guess I do not. Huh. Well, I uh, I did some cleanup of the maps, and so I must have accidentally gotten rid of that. But anyways, so you get to the Janal Torsk, and, um, and he leads you into a common area uh, near the bridge. And you see Ferric Red Thane, this gentleman right here. Right here. This gentleman is sitting at a table in the common area. And uh, he tells you, he says, um, before you decide to take me into custody or kill me, I'm sure Admiral DeRokin sent you here on a murder mission. He says, uh, I have information that may be worth more than a hundred bounties on me. And the Marine commander looks at you and says, you're going to want to hear him out on this. Go on. And we don't want to kill him. The broken wants that, but we don't. So, by saying it, like, I, I may have promised his wife the, the honor of being alive. He tells you, he says, It is convenient that he has this information right now, though. Um, sorry, go ahead. He says, What if the ramrod straight and respectable Admiral DeRokin wasn't the pirate leader that you thought he was. What if? He says, the, the reason for the bad blood between Durokin and I is because I discovered Durokin's secret. Secret is what? Well, would this... It cut out. It cut out. Uh, yeah, oh. I discovered Durokin was, and then it he cut out. Said, he said, um... <laughs> bum, bum, bum. 
I, <laughs> and that's tonight's game. Um, and he says, uh, he says, uh, what if Daroken wasn't the pirate leader that you thought he was? I was originally in Daroken's gang, and I was kicked out because I discovered Daroken's secret. How much would that be worth to you? Well, he I'm sorry, what was that? Didn't he just say it was worth 10 times whatever bounty is on his head? How much he said that information is worth? Oh, it could be worth 100 times. He says, I discovered that the good admiral is still in contact with his handlers in the Imperial Navy. In fact, not just the Imperial Navy, but Third Imperium Naval Intelligence. You see, the Third Imperium is secretly uh, supporting the Admiral's little pirate gang. Does he know to what end they're doing this? Like why? Um, says I'm not sure, but it seems that they're using uh, Daroken as a plant and spy for the wilder regions of the Trojan Reach, and they've planted him in a very uh, special place as he is now a Lord of Thieves. Does he have any uh, like evidence of what he's saying? I I do have evidence, but not with me. I recorded some of Daroken's communications with the Imperium, uh, but these intercepted files are actually stored in a, secu in a secure computer on Daroken's flagship. He says it naturally it wouldn't be an easy matter, but if you were to steal away aboard the Admiral's flagship, you would be able to locate these files and see that I'm speaking the truth. Now, for you guys to sneak onto the Admiral's flagship and, and get to the secure uh, computer and steal these files would be damn near mission impossible. So there's no evidence that we can actually like possibly get to. <clears throat> I mean it's it's he he doesn't have any now. But he's telling you where it is. You can't be certain if he's lying or not. For one. And for two. Uh, yeah, getting on board the Admiral's ship and getting to that sec secure computer is going to be difficult. Plus, there's the issue of what to do with that information. Like, if, if we've got mega credits coming our way, like, who... Who's going to buy that? And once that information is out, what purpose does it serve? There's that. Too. It seems better on to me. It seems better to know that he's shady and uh, work for, with that knowledge privately without sharing it with the system myself. But I don't know. I feel like we probably are supposed to do it. So how would this be worth a bunch of money to us, this information? Oh, I'm sorry. Jeez. Well, um, <laughs> he hasn't really considered that, but he's sure that there must be, if you were to have this information and you were to sell it to, say, Hurl Iron Tooth or, um, or Peter Valus. Basically, we pay a bunch of money for this information. 
Probably, mm -hmm. yes. Anybody, mm -hmm. any of the ship captains that decide that they want to take his position as Lord of Thieves would pay handsomely for the information because they can use it against him. He says, no offense. Wasn't he going to position to take over well, he was kicked out mm -hmm. of uh, he was kicked out of Darokin's gang when Darokin discovered that he had intercepted the transmissions, so he can't get to the secu the secured computer. He can't even go back to Thief because if he does, Darokin will have him killed. Which is why mm -hmm. he sent Miria Silverhand to Thief to try and broker a deal with mm -hmm. either Valus or Iron Tooth. To get the protection of one of their gangs. And uh, Valus is a racist one, right? Yeah, he hates Aslan. Okay, so is there a way to pass the existence of this information onto the other, um, the other person? I forget the Oh, Pearl Iron Tooth? Um, you could, but Iron Tooth would have the same problem that you would have in that he can't verify that this information is true because he can't get on board the Admiral's flagship to get to the secured computer to get the data. So basically, I mean, you have the information and uh, Farrakh Redthane is accepting the terms that you set out with Miria Silverhand. He's expecting you to take him into custody. Um, but he's telling you, <clears throat> you know, there's this information out there that you may or may not want to do something with. You know, maybe that, maybe that buys my life. Yeah, if we're in a position to um, look into the claim and it turns out to be true, if we can repay him, then we'll make good on that. I'm comfortable promising that if the rest of you are. Okay. Uh, now, are you planning on... Assuring, assuring him that we're not planning on taking it to Droken anyway. We're after the six sheet, the six ship fleet and not killing him, handing him over alive to the other guys. So I feel like he's, right now, he's bargaining for his life, but we have, don't have any intention of handing him over to Drogan anyway, unless I misunderstand. We could, you know, quote unquote, hand him over to Drogan on Drogan's flagship, and then that's our way on. What does he think of that plan? I mean, he used to be part of the crew, so you'd think he would know if that would happen or not, if that's plausible. Um, he tells you that uh, it, it sounds like a good plan on paper, but the reality is that you wouldn't even have time to, to get onto Daroken's flagship. Daroken and his men would kill him in the airlock before he even stepped foot. All right, so that's plans out. Um, we hand him over alive. How long does he have until being like sentenced or just killed or whatever? Um, you're not sure. Uh, you've never dealt with the <coughs> you've never dealt with the legal system of Torpal or Clark, and it seems like um, since both those planets were hit, even though they have completely different governments and completely different legal systems. They're kind of banded together in a let's fuck this guy kind of legal court. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean execution. Although, the psychopomps of Clark are pretty pissed off about this pirate raid. We could only send the information and the handoff, like let's say we take him to Clark, we could 
then the information to the, about the handoff to the wife, and then she could break him out. We will have completed our contract. Right. But she'll know where he is, when he's being exchanged, and that he's still alive. But if anybody spots her, then they'll know that we were full of shit when we said that we killed her. So, I don't know. Mm -hmm. That is a thinker. But, um, we'll turn him over alive. Um, let's read him as Miranda right. It would be a different <laughs> I've watched enough Law and Order to know we have to read him as rights. So, uh, Ferric Red Thane, um, basically stands up and just holds out his hands and, like, lets you zip tie him. Um, and he tells you, uh, he, he basically, at first his, his, uh, Marine captain, like, is just pissed. He's like, wait, you're gonna take him into custody anyways? And what are you doing? And Red Thane waves him off and says, nope, stand down. This was our agreement. This is the best thing. This is how we get out of this. And uh, and he looks to Captain Beth and says, um, I, I trust that you'll take care of my small gang. You, you get all six ships, including the Janal Torsk. Excellent. Uh, so before going to his ship, uh, the his first mate, the Marine commander... We'll need to know uh, where he's taking the Janal Torsk. Are you sending him back to the space station or what? I kind of want to take him with us so that he'll um, see that we're not we're not horrible. Oh, okay. Because he seems disgruntled right now. Okay. So the Janal Torsk. We can't. If we can't tell the wife because she needs to stay hidden, he could put his Marines on one of the six, like the dumpiest of the six ships. Well, they all know where we're taking Red Vane, and they could bust him out if they wanted to once we leave. The other if five. He's out and they know where he is, so they can go get him. The other five ships have already jumped and are at your space station or en route there. Uh, I see. Okay. They'll be there in another week. Um, I guess I'll ask his opinion about where he wants to be stationed, if he wants to go to the space station, or if he thinks that the, um, the crew there will be fairly self-contained, or if they need more direction, or what his, what his thoughts are. Um... Well, to begin with, he's taken aback that you're asking him his opinion. Um, the Marine commander, uh, you could see the look on his face is like, huh, so this pirate captain's a little bit different in how she handles things. Um, he says um, it would make him feel better if he could <clears throat> follow you in the Torsk and... Uh, you know, see with his own eyes that you're turning Red Thane over uh, alive rather than killing him and spacing him. Um, and then from from Clark, when you drop him off, uh, he can take the Torsk back to the space station on Borite. That sounds fair. Okay. I'm okay with that. <clears throat> so, Ching Shi... Make or who wants to make the astrogation check to for the jump back to uh well hold on here I have to look at this let's see here. There is Steve. Oh, that's right. So, uh, so you would have to jump from uh, Thieve to the secret fuel cache. 
Uh, for your first jump, who wants to make the astrogation check? King Chi. I mean, you could always have Rexar do it, and we could have, like, a completely wacky adventure. <laughs> Trust me, I know what I'm doing. I don't know how to handle astrogations. <laughs> Where's the big red button? <laughs> it just says go. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like my tour. I press the big button and stuff happens. <laughs> well, that's about what we're looking at because let's see, I got snake eyes. Uh oh. And so then plus two would be four. And plus your six. either intellect or edu. Intellect would make it six. That's exactly what you needed. So. Oh my God. <laughs> so. <clears throat> Uh, your chief engineer, Chief Keith Clark, uh, you can make a, a J drive, engineering J drive check plus intellect or EDU, your choice. Okay. I allow either intellect or EDU because you can either be trained in it or just have knowledge of where the button is. <laughs> Seven. Okay, so that wasn't uh, as bad as you might think. You guys jump to the hidden fuel cache. It takes you a day or so to refuel. And uh, Ching Shi, go ahead and make another astrogation check. Six, eight, Nice. So, uh, so Chief Clark, make a uh, J Drive plus Intellect or EDU check at plus four. Eleven. Okay. So that puts you in the Torpol mm -hmm. system, uh, but you're going to go to Clark. Uh, do you want to dock at Torpol to refuel, or do you want to just skim the gas giant in Torpol and move on immediately? Now, one, I guess the, the better question is, do you want to spend money to refuel your ship? plus docking fees, or do you want to um, skim gas for free? How much money are we talking? Uh, that's a very good question. Mm. Well, let me find the carrier. I can tell you. So it can hold, it's got fuel for J2, four weeks of operation, plus docking fees. Uh, you're probably looking at 2,000 credits to dock. Then, of course, if you dock <coughs> to refuel, um, there's the issue of that you have a wanted felon on Torpal aboard your ship that somebody might try to um, accost the ship in order to get at him if they find out. Not that anybody on your crew is going to tell anybody, but you have the second ship. They are pirates after all. I think it's worth it. Yeah. Alright, let's scan. That's a good reason to scan. Okay. So, Ching Shi, 
make a, it is going to be a difficult check, make a piloting plus dex check. He shall do the same. Okay, you have no problem skimming. Uh, the pilot of the Janal Torsk is having an issue, but is able to pull out with only minor damage, but you are both able to skim the upper atmosphere and refill your tanks. It takes another um, 10 hours for your fuel processors to process the fuel. You don't want to jump with uh, raw fuel. It's uh, bad things happen. Um, that's a big, big cause for misjump. And uh, last astrogation check, Ching Shi. Go ahead and make your astrogation plus intellect check. Eight. Nice. Uh, Chief, the chief engineer, you can um, make your engineering J drive check at a plus two. All right. Okay. And you jump and you come out a week later in Clark. And of course, I just grabbed the wrong thing. Hold on just a moment. <clears throat> so you you come in. Or if we need to blow the block very soon for Rexar. Yeah, right. I think Rexar needs to explode something. Uh, we're, we're working on it. We'll find something. No, 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 you're going to have plenty of uh, plenty of opportunities in the coming weeks to kill all sorts of things. It's, <coughs> it's, it's just you got all your mechanical stuff to work on, and I am not very much mechanical stuff on. I said that, right? You are given. Uh, just... Sorry, go ahead, Rexar. He's playing with the dog. He just has his dog, and he's training. He's playing fetch with it. Or the weird bat or thing. I forget what it's called. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. I forgot what it's called, too. I'll have to look that up again. I keep forgetting that you've got the pet. The uh, alien bat dog. Lizard dog? So, I'm you're... A lizard bat dog. <laughs> you're radioed by uh, Clark Spaceport Control. Uh, wanting to know what your current destination is. Who's answering? Uh, um, we have a bounty to catch in. Redeem. You are given clearance <laughs> to land. Uh, Ching Shi, go ahead and make a piloting plus dex check. The only reason why I make you guys roll for this mundane stuff is to see if anything interesting happens. Okay. Massively at some critical time, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just waiting for it. I thought I was gonna miss. I thought I was gonna miss conversation with rolling two. So. You're lucky. Chi docks at uh, the Clark Spaceport. You've been in the necropolis before. And the it isn't the uh, high, it is not the high psychopomp boon that meets you. It is instead um, are we breaking up? Hold on. Fred has his own drum solo for his introduction. Evidently. It is... Q. 
Keeper Malos. And he comes out with armed guards and uh, he thanks you profusely. He is also joined by uh, Provost Falks from Torpal. And they have been, <clears throat> the Keeper, Keeper Malos and Provost Fal uh, Falks have been uh, discussing how the two planets can work together in coming to a mutual um, agreement on how to handle Ferric Red Thing. Um, the, he is immediately ushered off into court. Hold on just a second here. See if that helps. And the entire trial takes all of about two hours and he's found guilty. We got the, the trial takes all of about two. The, the trial takes all of about two hours and he is found guilty. What's his sentence? Uh, sentencing takes about another two hours and the sentence is carried out immediately. They freeze him in carbonite. And been paid just out of, like has the check cleared? Oh yes, yes. Uh, you are paid two point five mega credits. That is two million five hundred thousand credits. That might have an impact on what happens next is if the check cleared or if it bounced. Oh yes, it cleared. Um, the obelisk of carbonite that he's frozen into is then taken aboard Provost Falk's ship, and he is to be placed in geosynchronous orbit around Torpal as a warning to other pirates of what happens to them when they attack Torpal or Clark. Can you undo carbonite freezing just out of curiosity? Yes. It is uh, dangerous and most most often ends with the the person frozen dying, but it, it is possible to to be thawed out. Yeah, I did that once. I thought they were going to be mad. <laughs> I guess they didn't realize it was us. Okay. Beat. I, uh, yeah, you, so you guys want to try to place a mm -hmm. beacon on him? Give the beacon to me, and we're like, oh, that looks heavy, let me carry it. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Oh, I can be slippery, key. All right, give me the shot of the beacon. That's cool. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, it's geo, <laughs> it's, it's geosynchronous orbit, so, I mean, it's always going to be in the same line around the planet. Okay, so I just really need to make note of where it is if I want to tell someone else. Okay, yeah, you you don't have a problem with that. The sensor logs on your ship would pick that up. It's not like when else might want to buy him, then we could we could bounce him again or sell his location to his crew or something like that. Well, you did agree you would originally told Miria Silverhand that you would give her the information um, uh, either about his prisoner transfer or where he was being kept so that she can do with that what she will. Um, now, <clears throat> the Commander Ralston of the Marines on the Taurus, who is currently in charge, um, thanks you and... Uh, says that you he he's impressed that you held not only kept your word but um you did this in an honorable manner thank you for noticing <laughs> <laughs> who has streetwise anybody i think we're with no no yes that's me that's okay. Go ahead and <clears throat> make a streetwise plus intellect check. Ten. Okay. 
I doubt that court proceedings are really Raph's, much Raph's thing. So she probably ducks out early and hits the bar near the, uh, near the, the legal proceedings. And Raph, you pick up uh, some rumors that uh, the, the reason why Keeper Malos uh, was kind of put in charge of this situation uh, was because the high, the high psychopomp, the space pope, um, isn't here on Clark. He has traveled to Drynax because of an agreement that he believes that you made with him, the, the crew, <clears throat> that, uh, and you may remember this was said in passing right before you left Clark last time, that uh, the high psychopomp wants Prince Herrick of Drynax to be declared uh, a part of the religion. And so the psychopomp has gone to Drynax uh, to name him the successor, or name him his successor as high psychopomp. He wants to name him Pope in case he dies. All right. And that's why mm -hmm. he's not here. Now, hmm. since this all began, <clears throat> you have not been back to Drynax. So, if this guy went to Drynax and is trying to proclaim uh, Prince Herrick to be the successor to the religion, um, who knows what kind of comedy is going to ensue? Because uh, nobody has informed King Oleb that any of this has taken place. Mm. <laughs> we did it, you guys. <laughs> hey, you've got 2.5 million credits. You know, that's, that's not a bad haul. Uh, and Commander Ralston uh, takes off uh, once the uh, Janal Torsk is refueled, he takes off back to Borite uh, for your secret space station. Awesome. He seems very competent. Now, before he leaves, um, in your cargo hold right now on the Harrier, you have uh, some parts that you purchased to do further repairs and upgrades to the space station, such as fixing the, the uh, thrusters and things like that. Did you want to transfer them to the Torsk for him to take back to the space station, or do you only trust yourselves to do that? Do you guys trust him to do it? Because I, I kind of do. Yeah. I also want to see where the space probe storyline goes on Drainax more than... We can send our, our uh, bots. With the, oh, you said you want to send the uh, AX7 your droid? Yeah, the droid so that he can repair the ship. Good idea. I hadn't even thought of that. Okay. And uh, Chris, yes. I've had like a bunkmate passenger for the last couple of weeks or three weeks since we, uh, I don't know, left the fancy town. You have. And that is the next question have on the we, list. Have we been getting a lot Has she found some place she wants to drop anchor yet, or what's going on there? Uh, make a... So, Raph, make a persuasion plus intellect check. Well, that's better than what she rolled. So, <clears throat> here's what she tells you. So, um, and I have to look at her name. So, the first question is, on your ship, you still have 
the Varger named Kirsch. He is adamantly asking, or he's adamantly begging Teddy to talk to uh, Captain Beth about allowing him to become a permanent member of the crew. Man, that guy's shady as fuck. <laughs> He's really good with electronics, though. And, and we're pirates. Why not uh, let a fellow pirate join us? I guess we'll have to vote. We can always use the ancient pirate traditions of running him across the hall if he doesn't if he breaks the rules for a while. A high speed. Too. Yeah. <laughs> so. Right. Well, so it seems like we have two in favor and one opposed. Is that. And V Lawn tells Raph that uh, while she doesn't have a lot of interest in um, joining pirates. At the same time, she fully realizes that the company that she works for out of Tobiah basically left her to rot on Thief. Nobody came to figure out what was going on. Like, she was completely expendable. And so, um, she wouldn't have a problem joining the crew until such a time that she decided to leave. Yeah, that's fine with me. Don't hurt three. I think we should let her stay as long as she wants to. Now, Teddy is a hundred percent Teddy is a hundred percent for V Lawn staying. He he's okay with that. <laughs> And Teddy's not sure if he gets a vote, but he votes for Kirsch to become a member of the crew. And he promises that he'll keep an eye on him. What's this? What? It isn't meant to be the crew. I don't know. Uh, Teddy, Teddy says he's not sure if he gets a vote, but he votes that uh, Kirsch is made a member of the crew and he promises to keep an eye on him. Okay. All right. Yeah, Teddy can go. He bailed us out when the ship was going to get stolen. That was really, really nice. He's proven himself a whale. So, so you guys are going to move the cargo to the top Torsk and head back to Drynax. Is that your your plan for now? That was my plan. Um, open to other possibilities if anybody has any, but I really want to know how the space boat thing works out. That's like right <laughs> up my alley, like sci-fi wise, you know? Okay. Right? Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> the after it takes you about a day to transfer all the cargo. Um, your ship is refueled. Uh, you're paid in cashy money, and. Uh, the Taurus takes off and jumps for Borite, and you take off and jump for Drynax. Now, um, let's see here. It only takes you a week to get to Drynax, and you are given permission to land. You are uh, um, basically... Uh, hailed the conquering heroes more or less uh, the when you land uh, the people of the <clears throat> of the bazaar um, are just fawning all over you um, you are um, heroes of Drynax. so you land here in one and the bazaar is here and um, there are Banners up all over the place, um, welcoming the 
the high psychopomp of Clark. And you see a number of, uh, you know, religious cleric types from Clark standing around. Um, and as you come into the king's court, uh, you see the high psychopomp. You can't miss him because he has the Pope hat. And uh, from the, the closed throne room, you can hear King Oleb yelling at the top of his lungs, We're not a bloody theocracy! What is that idiot doing here? I never agreed for my son to become the new space pope! Okay, should we listen? Should we intervene? I don't remember how this is our fault, but I guess it is. <laughs> I'm okay with people fawning over me, but I so, touch my tail and cutting off their heads. So what happened was, is as you were... All I remember is um, trying to tell the high psychopomp about the cool of the crunchy wave. Right. <laughs> That's what if, if the prince was going to be forced to join any religious organization, <laughs> it's right. going to be the question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know what we should do. So can enjoy the show for a bit. I half of me wants to be like, whoa, 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 now wait a minute, think about this. That's <laughs> 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 the benefits of being a space pope, and you don't actually have to make things a theocracy. I don't know. That's my, my instinct. If I would, I think we should pull both of us and tell him that it's a way to expand the empire. Right? Like, so to tell you how. This is stretching out to another planet and securing your hold on at least one other planet. So to tell you how this happened, um, this is really actually Bakasura's fault. And he isn't here to see it. Right? Um, so what had happened was, is before you left, um, they, the uh, space pope, the, the high psychopomp, stopped you before you were leaving. And, and he approached the ship with all uh, pomp and circumstance, with, the, with his, you know... Uh, royal guardsmen and whatnot, and asked you that uh, if you would relay to uh, Prince Herrick, because Prince Herrick, many years ago, was almost killed. Um, technically, he was killed, um, but they froze his body in a low berth, and uh, the technology of the... Uh, Let's see, what is it called? There's a tower here. Dum, dum, ba, dum, ba, dum. Well, there's a there is a grand university and a tower of known technology, and this technology is the last repository of all of the high technology that was used by the Sindalian Empire. And I mean, they had some really high-tech stuff. Using that technology, they saved Prince Herrick. Or at least that's what they've told everybody. Nobody has actually seen him. But this information has leaked out of Droinax. And the high psychopomp was like, well, you know, our religion on uh, Clark is that, you know, we freeze people right before they die. And at the time of the great becoming, we will unfreeze everybody and they will be brought back to life. And um, so this technology is very similar. And so, you know, we want him to acknowledge our religion. That was the last conversation that you guys had. And Bakasura said, yeah, no problem, we'll do that. Thanks, Bakasura. 
So we, we've been welcomed as heroes. We give us the cloud to enter on this matter. Now the other thing to keep in mind too is that from your pirating and whatnot, um, ten percent of that needs to be given to King Oleb. So you've got some money to give it. Okay, so we have um, we have a good reason to break it up right now. True. Okay, and and perhaps talk to him, maybe talk a little bit of sense in him, not freak out <laughs> so hard. Especially against the devout religious, they like to like start wars over this kind of crap. So, so do you guys just open up the doors of the throne room and walk in? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. And they're like, would you excuse us? Kind of pull a Bill Murray from Ghostbusters, kick up the doors. We saw, we came, we kicked its ass. So, you guys. Open up the, the throne room to the uh, dragon throne, and <clears throat> King Olaf turns around, and he starts to say, how dare you? And he looks at you, and he says, oh, it is my, my little family of privateers. What have you brought me? Um, we have... I would know how many friends before <laughs> I went in there. Um, it's two hundred thousand, right? Two hundred fifty thousand. Right. Yeah, plus. Mentioned before. It's good news. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. What's what's their good news? Um, we out, we apprehended the um, mastermind behind the uh, siege or the raids. The raiding, yeah, the raids, and we got paid a bounty. So we need to kick to the here as we previously agreed. Excellent news. Oh, that should that should bring Clark and Torpal a little bit closer to rejoining the Empire. You notice that there are two other people in the room. Um, one is Princess Rao, who is trying to explain to her father, King Oleb, that, uh, you know, maybe naming Prince Herrick the successor to the psychopomp religion isn't really a bad thing. Because that would bring Clark even closer. Because now, if Herrick is going to be the new space pope, then that would mean that the religion would be the official religion of the Empire. So, that would technically mean Clark would be almost completely in, con in Drynax's control. So there's that. Oleb is hung up on the fact that nobody had bloody told me about this. I never agreed to this. Next to them is a uh, scruffy-looking uh, free trade captain that you have seen around the bazaar named Sal Dossett. And she says, well, you know, it's not necessarily that bad of an idea, but, you know, I have a, a good piece of information about bringing a planet in, too. What, what do I get? Um, I, I wanted to say that the psychopomps were um, instrumental in the success of our mission. He says... And they're like, thank you for their goodness. He, he looks at you and he says, Did you agree to this? To signing my son up for this? Uh, no, sir. That would be the drugged out uh, crazy one with whom we know of company association. Yep, he's never coming back. Uh, ever. However, <laughs> this was not his worst thing. I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't. This isn't his, the worst thing he's ever done by far. <laughs> 
Uh, Raf, who who has a good persuasion? I can persuade one. Anybody else? So. Uh, I will allow you to make that with a boon roll. So roll three dice to take the two highest because Raph is coming clean and um, kind of helping you out here. I rolled 10 and then you said boon dice and I rolled another six. So I rolled the highest possible. I got two sixes. Okay. So uh, King Oleb is like, well... I suppose it's not the worst thing to happen. And, and he, he uh, yells across the throne room and he says, Get in here, boy! And you see this young man come walking in. When I say young, he looks like he's probably 35. 34, 35. Wearing a white uh, military-type uniform with all manner of... Uh, fruit salad on his chest of different battle campaigns he's been in. And he says, uh, I would like you to meet my son, Prince Herrick. Everybody make a recon plus intellect check. Eleven. Wow. Six. So. Also eleven here. Okay, so everybody really but Keith Clark. <laughs> you notice that this guy <clears throat> is walking, um, really stiff, almost like he's, uh, like he's learning to walk again. Um. Raph, Raph and Rexar, you can see that uh, you're not quite sure what you're making out. You can't tell if portions of the skin on his face and neck are uh, really well done skin grafts, or maybe it's synthetic skin. But, but maybe it's Maybelline. Maybe it's Maybelline, yes. Um... The, the sense that you get is that Prince Herrick is more machine than man now. He's like worrying noise and stuff like walks around from the servo. Like oh no. Robot space boat. No. Yeah. yeah, he doesn't make any noises or anything. It just looks like he, it looks like he's getting used to a new body. All right, well, I'll be as respectful as possible in meeting the, the prince and future space pope. <laughs> <laughs> the once and future space pope. Uh, <laughs> so Sal Dossett uh, says, all oh, right, so that matter has been, uh, you know, handled. Uh, what, what, you know, how much is my information worth? You know, I, I've got some profit I need to make. Come on. And King Oleb goes, yes, all right, we will get to you. And he says, Sal here uh, says that there is a little revolution that is going on on the planet Akrit. Um, the workers union has uh, gone on strike. So the planet Akrid is owned part and parcel by the uh, PRQ Corporation. That's uh, Pax Rulin Quartermasters. They have quite the nice mining operation there. Uh, they also export uh, chemical products. Um, Acrid is a hell planet. Um, it is what would be considered to be a liquid, uh, uh, an ocean world. Except that the ocean is made up of uh, liquid ammonia, methane, and toxic chemicals. Uh, the few dry points 
uh, basically uh, have ferrite, uh, iron, nickel, copper, and so that's what is being uh, mined out of those deposits. Um, everybody on the planet is an employee of PRQ. Uh, recently, PRQ's profits have dropped, and <clears throat> because of that, PRQ has lowered the rate that, of pay that the workers are receiving. And they've gone on strike. To combat the strike, PRQ has brought in more workers, and you can see where this is going. Um, the workers' union leader has put out a call uh, for uh, mercenaries. Now, this would be an excellent opportunity if we were to, you know, send you in and you were to lift uh, Acrid from the clutches of PRQ, Drynax could come in and save the day of the workers' union and the inhabitants of Acrid, and Acrid would become a part of the kingdom of Drynax. So we get to secure the planet by liberating the proletariat? But what is on there? I, I heard the part about the horrible ammonia ocean. Like, what did it... Yeah, it sounds like it's a big fiery fart planet. <laughs> Essentially, yes. They, they mine out iron, nickel, copper, gold. Uh, they also uh, turn the liquid... Uh, hell soup into a number of useful chemicals, many of which are used on your starship. Can we change the name of the company to Soup Incorporated? Negotiations. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's resources. That makes sense. All right. So it's not just a big pile of shit. Like the planet being changed paper on was pretty awful, and it was also like an ocean world, so. I judge it pretty Well, I mean, at least uh, at least Chachi Walitakwe was water. True. That yeah, I don't. I don't want to know what giant heart planet squid, lava squid look like. I don't. I don't. I'm not really interested in that. <laughs> oh man, I bet the food there is so awful. Okay, but yes. We do need resources for the empire, so it sounds, sounds like a good idea if that was correct. So Sal Dorset, she she looks at you and she says, um, um, she says, all right, well, you'll want to travel to uh, Acrid and you'll want to use the guise of uh, that you're meeting uh, there to purchase uh, some ore. Whether you actually purchase ore or not is besides the point. But the person that you're going to want to make contact with is a woman named Gira Hollis. And Sal Dorset gives you uh, mobile contact information so that you can just use your phone to contact. And what does the what does the um, merchant expect in return? Cut. Um. Well, and that's what he's he's wanting to get from King Olib, and King Olib says, "Oh, oh," and he counts out some money, and he he from the two hundred fifty thousand that you gave him, and he says, "Here's ten thousand. That should be enough profit for you for bringing information." And Sal Dorset is perfectly happy with that, and. He or she takes that money and and says thank you have a nice day and leaves the throne room. Princess Rao is rolling her eyes. She's like, you could have given her seven thousand and she would have been just as happy, Dad. <laughs> oh, Darcy. <laughs> <laughs> King Oleb says something like, "Well, Rao, you're not in charge yet. You might be the." crown princess of Drynax and heir to my legacy, but you're not in charge yet, and until then, I'll handle my affairs as I bloody well please. That's 
Right. Parental authority. There you go. Rao just, again, just huffs and rolls her eyes, and she stomps out of the the uh, room. And then Olaf turns to Prince Herrick, and he says, Well, well, boy, you better step out there and accept your people and, you know, be priestly. I'm glad we didn't have to mess around with any of that. Um, what color is the smoke coming out of the chimney, BS? What do you do with the earth, folk? Right? <laughs> I like Carrie's like, picture oh, of the space pope. <laughs> Darth Vader and Pope are in Before we go on to the next thing, is there anywhere in the place that we didn't? Explore. Um, nothing <laughs> so much. I need some calm down. Okay. There's no, there will be more of uh, the floating palace uh, to explore when it's necessary. Um, I mean, the floating palace is a magnificent piece of uh, technology and architecture. It's too bad that it's floating over a bombed out planet. Um. The other thing to keep in mind, the interesting thing about the Floating Palace is that you can tell that at one time it was incredibly magnificent. There's statues that are 20 feet tall, and they're, the weird thing about it is there, you know, there are these beautiful statues, and then there's a laundry line that's tied hanging between them because refugees are sleeping in the corridors and have hung up their laundry, and there's you know a tent city set up, and the... Um, royal gardens have been turned into more or less a botanical garden in order to feed all these refugees. So, the floating palace is not as grand as it once was. It's a lot like Portland. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> um, Portland have a dragon throne, though. No, that's true. They don't have a dragon throne. Ted Wheeler wishes. <laughs> so, you guys uh, are are refueled and ready to go, and you make your way to Akrid. Uh Let's see here. Acrid is in the Borderland sector. How long are we talking? Let me find Acrid. Is the shopping on the Floating Palace decent though before we go, or not really? I know it's not as good as it used to be, but. Uh, yeah, actually. So, uh, <laughs> there are two people <laughs> on the Floating Palace in the bazaar uh, that can that are known to be able to get you just about anything you might want. There is Rashondo, who has Rashondo's Bazaar, and then there is Sal Dorset. Um, either of these uh, smuggling captains uh, are able to get almost anything you would need, including military-grade hardware on the occasion. Nice. He wanted to buy some combat on yeah, I want some combat armor. How much is that? Well, let's take a look. And I want to ransack Bacchusura's cabin for all of his psionic drugs. <laughs> I think he took those with him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Probably like the one thing he would take. Damn it. He. I want those He'll probably be back after he's finished moving. There's just no Wi-Fi there. Yeah, he's got he's he's got lack of Wi-Fi and he's in the process of moving. So uh, he can get you TL10 combat armor, uh, which requires vac suit one, but it offers 13 protection and it will protect against 85 rads. And he can get that for 96,000, like new. I think 
think I might upgrade to that too. So, ten. Is how much protection? Ten. It's plus thirteen. It's TL10. Uh huh. And Vax one. Yep, it requires that you have Vax suit one. So you'll want to make sure that you have Vax suit one. Okay. Sweet. All right, you're both set up. And I'll do math later, but I wrote down on these two Okay. Okay. Um, right. Anybody else? Any other, uh, any other shopping? That's all I wanted. Yeah, I'm set. Yeah. Is headgear thing? I'm sorry, what was that, Ralph? It said his headgear thing. Oh, uh, are you staring at my headgear? Um, is that wearing the Diplo vest underneath a flap shell? And neither one of those have any, like, you know, head or legs or back protection. And I was just wondering if there's any other kinds of armor, if it's all just kind of like a standard goes over your chest and body stuff. It's all pretty much considered to be a Part. I mean, if you wanted to buy a helmet to go with your flak, you could. It's not. It's not uh, going to give you any additional armor. Um, however, hold on, just a moment. I have something for this. So, Raph, while you are at Rashonda's Bazaar, you see that there is this little, well, I say little, it's about the size of a, a decent-sized suitcase that it has military markings on it. looks like it's been beat up a bit. And you recognize that this is what is called a unit data network. Now what a unit data network does is it has goggles with a personal heads up display that has 12 sets of goggles. Built into the suitcase is a communications unit. And what this communications unit does is it allows the goggles, which also have a camera on them, to connect via uh, telecom to the suitcase unit which can be installed into your ship and can do things like give a tactical map um, somewhat of x-ray vision so that if, if something on the other side of a wall can be seen uh, with sensors it can relay that information to the correct people like if there's a sniper they can relay that information to the sniper showing that there's something on the other side of the wall then all they need to do is find a way to shoot through the wall. Um, it can also set up for like automatic alerts. So if you're going through an area and you find that part of the area is set up with landmines or barbed wire, you can mark that location with a command word that updates everybody's heads up display so everybody sees it. And there is a. Let me guess. On jump journeys, when we're spending time hanging out on the ship, we can use it as a, a virtual reality console and play games together. Right? <laughs> well, you, you could use it for doing paintball <laughs> games around the uh, the cargo bay of the ship. Uh, there, you, you can get the hang of your cutlass by playing Beat Saber. Right, Beat Saber. Cutlass Fighter. <laughs> Uh, there is a <clears throat> tag hanging off of this, in the, and there's enough. There is more than enough. Yeah. I'm yeah. 
there is you've got your your ship fund and then how much how many how much money do you want each of the crew to get oh god i see math <laughs> and here's the bigger question are you going to continue to pay back asura while he's away getting his leg upgraded he did notice a space poke that's true <laughs> he was here for most of that last mission yeah he was yeah I think, I think you should get paid um let's try and figure out how many people are we splitting it between uh, one, two, three, four, five, six people. Six people. Should we split maybe like 120k between six people and then put the rest in the ship? Or what do you guys think? Okay. Let's see here. Let's see. Yeah. The 20, 20k each then? So 120k each, that would that's only 720,000. Oh geez, okay. But no, that's that's good because I mean if you did that, um Yeah. I mean that's still one point that's still one million five hundred and thirty thousand to go into the ship fund. A lot. Yeah, I need more the cost of the combat armor. Actually, I need to at least be able to afford that. Well, the combat armor is only ninety six thousand. Okay, and I was giving everybody twenty thousand. You said nothing. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a hundred and what if you gave what if you gave everybody a hundred thousand and put the rest in the ship fund? That's only six hundred thousand, which means that it would be one point nine no one point six five uh let's see here. Million in the ship fund. The previous thing was if I gave a hundred twenty K to each person, is that what that's what you Okay, yeah. Um, okay, I think that I want to do the 128k to each person and then put out there that, like, it is possible to borrow from the ship fund if the numbers cost or, like, an amazing opportunity that arises. Like, we can all agree. Yep. A zero interest loan. A zero interest loan, yeah. I'm trying to be fair so not. So everybody gets a hundred and twenty thousand to add to their to their credits. Yes. Now, and last but not least, everybody gets three skill points for completing episode one. Right. I want, I'm still trying to figure out how to use mine. So I have, I now have four skill points that are currently unused. Okay. I can move to that page. And I just, and I, I read the page that you did and it still did not, my brain couldn't translate it. Okay, so skills are basically a, a one for one expenditure. So if you have, if you want to buy a brand new skill at rank zero, it costs you one skill point. If you want to raise a skill that is rank one to rank two, 
it costs you two skill points. Or, I'm sorry, one skill point. Uh, no, scratch that. I'm sorry. If you want to buy a brand new skill at rank zero, it costs one skill point. If you want to raise a rank zero skill to one, it costs one skill point. If you have a rank one skill that you want to raise to two, it costs two skill points. If you want to raise to three, it costs three skill points, etc., etc. Now, where it can get confusing is if you decide that you want to raise characteristics. Um, physical characteristics, strength, dex, and endurance are a one-for-one -one value. So, um, <laughs> let's say that you have endurance eight. If you want to raise it to nine, it costs nine skill points, or nine XP. Um, mental statistics, intellect, and EDU are two for one. <clears throat> so to go from uh, education of eight to an education of nine is going to cost you 16 XP. So what's the difference between... You're giving us skill points, not XP points. Well, they're right? they're they're XP, yes. Or is that the same thing? XP points. So it's XP that can be converted into new skills, or if you save up enough, you can increase okay. your current characteristics. Got it. to be increased. But so to go from... 13 skill points. So to go from... Uh, let's see here. To go from 6 to 7 would cost 7 points. Oh, it would cost 7 points. I thought you said we had to add them together. That's, only, that's for... 13. That's for mental statistics. Oh, okay. I understand now. I understand. Well, I'm halfway to increasing a strength point. That might be worth it. Could be, yeah. Okay. What's your dex? My dex is nine. All of them are low. My strength is six. My dex is nine. Endurance is eight. Well, I mean, for the most part, you're going to be doing um, ranged combat with a gun. So, in this game, I would almost say that I mean, it might it might be better to save up enough points to raise your decks, if that's the route you right. want to go. I just was thinking about the taking damage. So that would be endurance. Yeah. When does a uh, dex go from plus one to plus two? Uh, at twelve. Wow. Oh shit. Well, never mind. <laughs> yeah, buying so, characteristics yeah. are expensive. A score of 12 should have a plus 2 modifier? Correct. Alright. Well, I have not been doing a plus 2 modifier. I suppose. Well, gotta think about it. So, in all honesty, I mean, unless your endurance is, you know, really pitiful, um, you would get more out of either buying new skills or raising skills up than you do out of increasing characteristics. I spent all my own skills just now, so I'm, I'm set. Right, and that, that would be completely normal. Okay. 
So, you guys <clears throat> set off for Acrid. Hold on a second. What am I? So, you set off for Acrid and uh, uh, use the excuse of uh, trading to land. Now, here's something that Keith Clark will enjoy. The new paint job on the Harrier, you find out the paint was actually a reflective coating that is used for the newly repaired holographic generators. So these holographic generators on the hull, you can't change the shape of the ship, but you can randomly change the paint scheme. Oh, uh, cool. To anything you want. So the ship doesn't have to look the same twice. <clears throat> Programmed in, by default, is the standard um, Sindalian um, royal paint scheme. But you can sit there and spend time coming up, you know, with your custom pirate colors where you change your ship to black and red with skull and crossbones. Or anything you want. You could technically even use it to make it look like your ship has taken battle damage in order to lure <laughs> in a ship. Things like that. Hey. <clears throat> And so the yeah, there's there's nearly endless uses for this. Uh, so yeah, that was part of the repairs that were done. And so, <coughs> how do you guys want your ship to look as you're coming into port? Do you want to be flying the royal colors or? <laughs> Um, I think we should want our colors. On um, methane world? I don't know. Is it <laughs> oh, no, but if we paint the ship blood red. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll let you guys fight for it because I don't, I don't know if it's going to matter a whole lot on this. With, with little holographic skeletons <laughs> chained to the outside. <laughs> <laughs> All wrestle and our vote on our blood red. Blood red, it is. That's what we're doing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you're uh, given um, landing clearance. Now, <clears throat> who wants to make an electronic sensors check? Oh, dear. okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we're, uh, we're sorry I got to roll the damn thing. Well, I got to roll that recon check when we were, I got to roll one thing. <laughs> Let's see here. 11. Okay. So as you're coming in, <clears throat> so your jump from the, from the jump location to planet, <clears throat> your sensors pick up that in the Akron system that PRQ Corporation has two system defense boats in, in the system. One seems to stay fairly close to the planet. The other system defense boat uh, kind of ranges out towards the mid, uh, the middle of the system in the asteroid belt. Now, the reason this is concerning is that any revolution that happens on this planet, something is gonna have to be done about those system defense boats. System defense boats are exceptionally dangerous because they are you know, ton for ton, they'll beat the shit out of a jump ship because they don't have a jump drive and all that space that they're saving, they fill up with more guns and armor. So pound for bound, those those system ships can beat the hell out of a, any jump capable vessel. So that's the first thing that you notice. Then as you're, so Ching Shi, you make a piloting plus dex check. Okay. 
and Rexar make a recon plus intellect check at plus three. Uh, let's see. I get plus two to that, so it's plus five, basically. Uh, fourteen. So, as Ching Shi is perfectly bringing the ship in to land, Rexar, you're in the uh, particle beam bar uh, barbette, and you notice <clears throat> that there are two missile turrets guarding the hangar bay. Oh. And this hangar is kind of built into a cliffside. Oh, all the missile turrets are going to get us. Uh, they are tr they are tracking you as you come in. They're not armed, but they are tracking you. The track did us. Uh oh. Uh, so Ching Shi brings the ship in for a landing, <clears throat> and uh, you're able to radio this uh, Gera Hollis, and she says to meet her at <clears throat> at Club Nine. Uh, which is a dive bar that the miners like to go to. Mm -hmm. And you make your way through this this small mining settlement. Um, it is domed underground, or not domed, but it's inside a cliffside. Um, any access to the outside is either by airlock or domed because Akron has a very thin atmosphere, and the atmosphere is insidious. So everything that spends time outside of the of the settlement um, and even the settlement itself has a constant battle against this atmosphere boiling its way through the seals so everybody that lives here about 80 percent of their time when they're not working is spent repairing airlocks repairing vac suits because the atmosphere just destroys everything it's an acidic atmosphere this planet sucks <laughs> You make your way through the mining settlement to Club 9, which has uh, numerous uh, strippers and a lot of neon and black lights. And there's maybe only five people, and the, the exotic dancer that's dancing is long in the tooth, and you're glad that there's black lights. They hide a lot. Okay. And <laughs> uh, Gira Hollis uh, meets you orders you a round of drinks, anything that you would like, and calls you back to a back table in the corner. And we will pick up your meeting with Gera Hollis and what exactly she's looking for next week. May I erase their school points? Definitely will. Yeah, I, I highly recommend spending the XP on gaining either new skills because any skill that you have, even if it's it, it's just rank zero, that means that you don't have to worry about a negative three to your dice rolls for being untrained. Now, there are two things that cannot be bought. You cannot ever buy jack of all trades. And you with XP points, you can never raise your social skill, or rather your social characteristic. However, social characteristic can be increased through role play and events that happen in game. So, there's that. And you know, it's my lowest stat, I believe. Yeah, I think all of you have a dump stat for uh, social. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean... <laughs> Gave everybody a post point a couple of weeks back, right? Yes, I did. Mine is isn't my dump. My dump stat was strength. My social is plus one. Nice. Nine. My social is four is minus two, right? Uh, minus one. <gasps> Your charmer. Four is a minus, is one. minus one. Uh. Yeah, Rex is the, the big cat man. It's evident, a lot of people don't like him. But see, so Rexar could, you know, come into land tomorrow, and his Sosh could go from 4 to 12 instantly. You know, you could get, uh, you could be titled nobility and go from a rank of 5 
to 13 instantly. So that kind of thing can change. And social means different things to different people. And it means different things in different places. So it's a very fluid uh, stat. Cool. Let's get it on. All right. Um, I don't know. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Have a good night, guys. We'll see you next week. Next week. See you next week. Bye.